So in the uh, last talk, I went through um, open fractures, um, osteomyelitis, deep bone infection. Uh, we talked about how um, you know with open fractures, the whole goal is to try and avoid infection, and especially avoid uh, chronic infection like osteomyelitis, it's a very devastating problem. An infected nonunion is even more devastating. Um, and um, uh, that said, in some patients, uh, it can be cured uh, with aggressive resection. Uh, but it's a very, it takes a very certain, uh, you know, type of patient to be able to go through that. Um, and uh, certain local biology and, of course, surgeon who knows how to, how to handle it to, to get a patient through a bad case of chronic osteomyelitis. So we're going to move on now and talk a little bit about pathologic fractures. And as I said in the very first uh, uh, lecture at the beginning, that we'll also kind of lump in osteoporosis here. And then I'll also uh, tie in hip fractures being sort of the, one of the prototypical osteoporotic fractures that I think, you know, as clinicians you should be aware of. Uh, know a little bit about. So um, many pathologic fractures will give a history of minimal or no trauma. So especially a tumor like this. Somebody's got a tumor here may just say like suddenly they got up out of a chair and their leg gave way and they come in and they have this fracture. And I would tell you that it's not always this obvious where there's this big sort of moth-eaten lytic type lesion in this little crack here. They'll probably come in just with a fracture because once it's broken it's a little bit harder to, under to, to see that it broke through a lesion. Uh, especially if it's not a big lesion like this. Uh, but another, but it's important. This is where history is really, really important. You get this from the history. They come in with a femur fracture. You don't take a careful history. You may not recognize uh, that maybe there was a tumor there. <clears throat> that said, they may also have uh, prodromal pain, meaning that you, know, you get more history and they say, well, yeah, you know, it's been hurting me for about a week. Um, or a month or something and the pain's been getting worse. It always hurts when I walk on it. So um, it's important to pick up on that history. So it's due to weakening of the bone by a tumor or metabolic disease. Um, and uh, you know, osteoporosis is uh, certainly a uh, uh, more in the metabolic disease category. Those typically do involve some trauma. So whereas somebody with big lytic lesion here probably has no trauma, uh, an osteoporotic fracture will occur with some trauma, but it's usually not like they not like a severe trauma. So whereas, you know, uh, an, a young healthy patient would have to be in a car crash to break their hip, an elderly person can fall out of their chair and break their hip, right? So it's sort of a spectrum of uh, of trauma um, or how much trauma it takes to break your bone. Okay, um, a, a tumor um, could be. Uh, known metastatic disease, so somebody with known metastatic breast cancer, let's just say, or unknown metastatic disease. Somebody presents with a pathologic fracture, you, you figure it seems to be pathologic, but they don't have known metastatic disease, but this is the first presentation of it. That happens. Um, or it could be a bone tumor, meaning a primary bone tumor, like osteosarcoma or something like that, uh, or myeloma, certainly one of the more common ones. So, um, you know, tumors are either primary or secondary, right? So primary bone tumor is much less common, although myeloma in, you know, certain age group is uh, um, somewhat common. But by far, you know, as far as tumors are concerned, most of what we see are metastatic disease and most metastatic diseases in older patients. Now, um, metabolic etiology also, uh, uh, you will also see this, mostly osteoporosis. Um, although other diseases like Paget and hyperparathyroidism are not completely uncommon. Um, suspect a primary tumor in younger patients with aggressive appearing lesions. So something like this, you know, you could say, um, you know, it's kind of got a poorly de uh, defined zone of transition. Uh, maybe this is not the absolute best example, but, um, you know, there's clearly a lytic lesion here. I'm not sure it's absolutely here, but uh, you know, it looks like there's a fracture over here. I think the lesion comes here, but I'm not sure. Maybe it extends further. Um, I mean, I would say this this certainly looks a little bit aggressive. 
Uh, perhaps there's some periosteal reaction out here. Maybe not a great example, but there's a fracture through here. Uh, so this is an example of a pathologic fracture uh, in a um, aggressive appearing uh, lesion, um, possibly bone, primary bone tumor. Here's an example of Paget's disease. Very classic radiographic appearances here. So here you can see some of the um, appearances of the th sort of thickened cortices, coarse, the thickened trabecula, right? So you can kind of uh, you can see some of that uh, over here and over here, or very, some people say very purposeful trabecula where they kind of stand out a little bit. Uh, you have this bowing, okay? And the bowing here and uh, the metabolic uh, disease, you know, with the Pagets probably is what predisposed to this fracture occurring, you know, under tension over here, because when you have this uh, bow like this, there's going to be tension at this area. You can see a crack starts here and then propagates over here. So, um, not not a good uh, not a good situation. Tough to deal with because these fractures have delayed healing. Uh, also keep in mind that a small percentage of patients with Pagets can have malignant transformation to a Pagetoid osteosarcoma. Um, a rare thing, but something that gets tested on. Um, what about uh, metastatic disease? Well, it's the uh, most common uh, cause of. Uh, of uh, what we see uh, causing pathologic fractures other than osteoporosis. Um, so again, relatively older patients, 50, 60, 70, 80, um, they're most likely going to have uh, metastatic disease if you uh, see a bone lesion pathologic fracture. Um, Location-wise, the femur and the humerus are the most common appendicular sites. So the uh, femoral neck, intertrochanteric region, you can see there's actually multiple lesions here, right? There's one here. Uh, there's uh, kind of a lesion maybe over here, a little bit less defined. Uh, there's one here. If you look very carefully, you can see the cortices are a little bit scalloped out. Um, so uh, uh, the humerus, like I said, is another common location for metastatic disease. Of course, the spine and pelvis are what we're talking mostly here about long bones. So let's talk about osteoporosis. Well, osteoporosis is when you have a decrease in bone density with normal bone mineralization. Okay, so it's just overall thin bones. Uh, it's different than osteomalacia, like vitamin D deficiency, with you know just decreased bone matrix mineralization, with or without a change in bone density. And there's multiple risk factors, which I list here. Osteoporotic fractures include hip fractures and other fragility fractures. They're increasing in incidence. They're more dif it's more difficult to achieve stable fixation with surgical repair because you know, the bone is thinner, right? So the screws don't hold as well. I mean, there's been a whole sort of wave in technology with locking plates and sort of ad advanced fixation devices to uh, get better repairs in osteoporotic patients. Uh, Keep in mind that if an elderly patient has a low energy hip fracture, they most likely have osteoporosis and should be treated medically. Uh, that is, if they didn't know they had osteoporosis, if they fall out of their chair and have a hip fracture and they look osteopenic on x-ray, well, they probably have osteoporosis by definition. And, um, you know, they should be referred to their medical doctor for treatment once they leave the hospital. Now, prevention with proper screening can prevent fragility fractures, and I won't get into that too much here, but obviously DEXA scanning, appropriate screening by, uh, you know, in, in primary care can help to prevent hip fractures and fragility fractures from occurring in the first place. But that said, if you diagnose them, or importantly, if you pick up a patient who has an osteoporotic wrist fracture, for instance, great opportunity to um, get them uh, uh, properly screened and treated for osteoporosis at that point before they get a hip fracture. Okay? Let's talk about hip fractures. Um, the three you need to know about, uh, femoral necks, intertrochanteric, and subtrochanteric. So these are really just anatomic, and I'll, I'll focus really more on the top two. Subtrochanteric is essentially uh, almost like a proximal femur, you know, femoral shaft fracture, essentially. Uh, they can uh, you know, bleed a lot. They typically are fixed with intramedullary devices, but um, usually when we talk about hip fractures, it's most of the time one of the top two, um, but you'll certainly see subtrochs as well. 
So um, a femoral neck fracture is an intracapsular fracture. Um, and what I mean by that, it's, it occurs with inside the hip joint capsule. So it's kind of bathed in joint fluid. Uh, when you get a fracture, the joint fills up and distends with blood. Um, because it's bathed in joint fluid, the healing is a little bit slower. And it's more difficult to achieve. Um, with femoral neck fractures, you can disrupt the blood supply to the femoral head, and this can lead to osteonecrosis or AVN. Um, and uh, you know that's a very disabling condition. When you get AVN, um, and again, AVN is uh, you know osteonecrosis is the preferred term. AVN is a vascular necrosis, and uh, that is a term that was used uh, you know more in the past, but you should be familiar with it as well. That's a term you may have some clinicians still use. Uh, so here, if you look at some of the you know fractures, here's a fracture that's relatively non-displaced. Here's a fracture that's probably displaced, although I think they're considering this impact of the fracture line is about here. And you can see up here, there's a step off, right, where that fracture is, you know, head is supposed to go. Uh, and then these are examples of displaced femoral neck fractures where the head is completely off, right? I mean, here you can see the fracture, or the femoral neck is right there, and then the head is down here. This is probably where the other end goes. <coughs> okay. So um, how do you treat them? Well, um, femoral neck fractures can be treated with um, ORIF for the impacted and non-displaced uh, varieties. Um, here's examples of those. Uh, but displaced fractures are also treated with ORIF in young patients, and that's an urgent surgery. So somebody comes in with a femoral neck fracture, they're 40, 28, whatever, consider that young. If it's a displaced femoral neck fracture, that's not like some just admit you know, go round on the next morning and, you know, just add it on for the end of the day or whatever. I mean, that's a relatively urgent surgery. That's either, you know, go in at the end of the day uh, when it comes in or right away or middle of the night or, you know, perhaps the, the next morning at the latest, but this is not just some, you know, case that's going to sit around 24, 48 hours and you're just going to sort of do within a day or two, but you have to have more sense of urgency in the young patient with a displaced femoral neck. Why? Well, because, again, the blood supply is disrupted in these. It's felt that the, the more quickly you um, reduce them and restore alignment, you can perhaps improve the blood supply. Hemiarthroplasty is a treatment option in the displaced fractures in the elderly, uh, especially low-demand patients. Uh, here's an example of that. Whereas higher-demand patients, we've been found that uh, when you do a, a hemiarthroplasty, you put a, a large, large head on the femur, it can wear through. So you do a total hip arthroplasty. Here you can see, here's actually, this part is the femoral head, and then this is a metal shell that goes in the acetabulum. You'll see this when you do your total joints, um, and um, you have a bearing surface in between. And what about intertrochanteric? Well, intertrochanteric fractures are extracapsular fractures. There's more blood loss. These are the more common types. They're treated with ORIF or nail-type devices and not with a joint replacement. Okay, so this is actually not a fracture here. Um, I guess, you know, we could just show, I mean, intertrochanteric here really is talking about, you know, fractures that occur, you know, somewhere in this area. Okay, and it's, it seems like such a small little area, but it's just, I get a lot of fractures there. I mean, here's a great example down here. You can see the lesser trochanter is off. The fracture is probably somewhere up here, and then there's a little overexposure here. But you can see this is, this is not a femoral neck fracture, right? A femoral neck fracture occurs somewhere around here. Okay, so this occurs down here. It's extracapsular. It's going to be treated with ORF or a nail, right? And here's a couple of examples. Um, here you can see more of this is uh, more of a two-part fracture and treated with this sliding hip screw device. And here's a nail. This is more of a four-part fracture. You have uh, greater choke cancer, lesser choke cancer fixed with a nail. So, so I think I'll end there, and we'll uh, pick up on the uh, fracture non-unions and uh, getting close to the end here in the uh, next one. Uh, thanks.